the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ebro, Laura Rosenberg. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for locking in today's guest, the chair and CEO of the MTA Big Subway Talk this morning. Give it up one time for Jano Libra. How are you, sir? Doing great. How you doing? Good. Thanks for I, this. May be the first time someone from uh, the MTA has come on Rosenberg. Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I, think I appreciate you guys on on your side making the effort here, reaching out. This is cool. Yeah, that make that. I'm surprised about that because it's you guys speak to New York uh, every day, and we're moving New York every day. It's kind of the heart of what makes New York New York. So it makes sense to connect. Well, absolutely. And uh, we spend a lot of time ridiculing y'all for things that we want changed. So I'm glad you're here so we could get into the nitty gritty about it and, and hear the why or why not of certain items. First item. Yeah, I think this is the big one. Why have we not put up barricades like other cities to prevent people from being pushed into the tracks? So um, this is something that we act, the MTA, this is long before I got here, uh, but uh, the MTA actually did like a 4,000 page study of every station in the system to figure out if it was possible. And it's possible, but not in as many stations as you and I would like um, right. without getting too technical. It's engineering stuff. Um, basically, you can't block the ADA access on the platform. And a lot of those platforms, especially the outdoor ones, can't accept the additional uh, weight. But we are going to find a way to pilot this idea. And uh, Ebro, Laura, L L Rosemary, let me just tell you, there's a lot of other issues about safety that we have to attack. We have people, most of them mental health issue people, who are getting on the tracks all, a lot more than in the old days. And we have to find a way to interdict that because that's not just creating really dangerous conditions, but it's also stopping trains and inconveniencing right. people so so it's more than just the platform doors it's about finding a way to deal with the whole issue of people on track so i, I put together a, a working group to attack the whole issue we're going to come out with some recommendations in the next month on do that note that oh this, sorry go uh, ahead laura go ahead do you do you feel that this got uh, the problem got worse after covid or during yeah, what, and after covid yeah i mean listen what we the, the, the stats on subway safety, this, the overall system is is pretty safe. The levels of crime um, compared to what they were when we were all you know much younger, when I grew up in New York in the 70s and 80s, for example, are much better. But we had a lot of these super high profile episodes where, you know, people who have mental health issues are, are you know, the, the worst one, of course, was someone getting pushed on the tracks, but just generally they're disproportionately impacting on people's experience in the subway because they're, you know, they're 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 acting out in the system. So this definitely got worse during COVID. There are more people with those problems who are taking refuge in the subway system. And we're calling on the mayor and the governor, who both are committed on this issue, to figure out how do we get these people into services and out of the subway system. In the uh, in the past, um you know, Laura, myself, and Rosenberg have talked about the barricades going up at, at least some of the more high traffic yeah. uh, locations. You know, uh, I think understanding that it probably won't be able to go any, everywhere, but at least the most uh, heavily, you know, uh, heavily trafficked uh, stops in the system. Is that how you guys are going to pilot this? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're limited, as I said, by these sort of engineering realities right now, but we're going to choose... Uh, among the stations that can take the additional barricades, we're going to choose ones that, as you say, are high traffic, um, where a lot of people use it and the platforms might be crowded at times. Got it. So what else can be done general safety wise on the trains right now? There's like a, a lot of concern, whether it's founded or not. And first of all, let me, let me start there. How founded are people's concerns that the subways post COVID the subways now are crime-wise more dangerous than ever? Is that a founded concern? Well, again, I, I think, you know, Rosenberg, I talked about it before. Overall statistics, the subway is way safer than it used to be. And we're all old New Yorkers, so we remember, remember back in the day. But the big picture is the numbers of crimes and, 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 and troubling incidents have gone up since before COVID, right? 
So we have to react to that. We have to make sure the subway feels safe because we want everybody to come back to work. It is essential for New Yorkers, especially you know, essential workers and people uh, from lower income communities, that the subway be a place where you feel comfortable, where you can get where you need to go. So we're, we are, again, we're not in control of the policing, obviously, and the law enforcement issue, but we are urging our partners in the city and the state to take action and help us to bring this, you know, to turn the, uh, the, the, the trend around. Um, that, that, that's really the, you know, among the top priorities that I've got working with the Adams administration. In fairness, Mayor Adams and his team have been saying all the right things, and they are committed to trying to bring this issue under control. Um, just for, I guess, uh, comprehension, um, prior to us starting this conversation, uh, you mentioned that the way our subway system was built is unlike other subway systems around the world. Um, what challenges does that, uh, you know, propose, right? Because our subway system is older than most. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that it's not as deep as other ones. Um, how does that affect our ability to make safety improvements? Well, you know, it, it's a good question. I mean, mostly it's an issue of like, uh, you know, keeping water out. And you and I were kidding around about rats. Um, the, the, those, the principal challenge is we've got a very shallow system. The subway system was built, you know, over 100 years ago. People basically dug shallow ditches and put some structure on top and started to run trains. Other places which have newer systems have been, using modern tunnel boring, they go into rock and it's very much deeper and it's easier to keep it uh, and keep the water out and keep the above grade conditions out. Uh, but the, you know, what we have, the challenges we have are, are both because it's shallow and because it's old. You know, when we, we saw, for example, during Hurricane Ida, all that water getting into the subway system. By the way, we cleared out all that water in a matter of hours and ran rush hour service in the morning. So the system looked, right. in, turned out to be incredibly resilient. But water is going to get in and people are building new buildings adjacent to the subway system. And the utilities are knocking holes in the sidewalk. And that creates a lot of problems in terms of physically maintaining this very old structure. Concrete, steel, don't like water. They don't like chemicals. They don't like salt. And all that stuff gets in. And the result is that we have... You know, we have to make serious investments just in the physical structure of the system to make sure it keeps running. The advantage of having a slightly shallower system, of course, uh, folks, is that is that you don't have to go as far to get into it. And what we need to do now is invest in elevators uh, so that this becomes a truly accessible system for people in wheelchairs, people in who bring in strollers, older people who don't want to go up and down stairs. That has been a priority that I brought to the MTA. And we are knocking out new elevators in, 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 in the system much, much faster than ever before. How do we prioritize as a city neighborhoods that uh, are more low income and more vulnerable? It always feels like, you know, neighborhoods where poor people live get the, you know, they get the short end of the stick, you know, and they, they don't they don't get as much support. How does the MTA address that? It's a really good point. We, the, the term that we use in the industry is transit equity. That we found out during COVID that the people who depend most on mass transit and who are our best customers, in effect, are people, as you say, from low income communities, essential workers, people whose jobs require them to go to work, people whose kids got to go to school and who aren't taking an Uber to school, right? So we, I, I, we agree with what you know, the premise of your question, Ebro, which is there needs to, equity needs to be a priority in the system. How are we attacking it? Number one, I'm trying to make the bus system much faster. Buses are, in a lot of low-income communities, the only mass transit because people live further away from the rail system. The second, you know, we have to make it so that the bus is faster than walking. And there, there are a lot of things we're doing mainly getting the city to put in more bus lanes and having more bus lane enforcement so we can actually have faster buses. The other thing is we're making major investments in communities we call transit deserts, the areas that don't have yeah. good mass transit. The East Bronx, we're taking that Amtrak line where they run 25 trains an hour, you know, mostly going to Boston or New Haven, and turning it into a Metro North line so people in Co-op City all of a sudden can get to Manhattan you know, a job mm. in, in Central Business District in 30, 35 minutes instead of riding the so-called express bus for an hour and a half. 
right? And they can also, when, if, if it's on the Metro when will, North When line, will Co-op City see that? That's in, we actually, I actually prioritized that project and it's now under, you know, it's literally we awarded the contract at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, last year and the construction's underway. So it's a, it's a few years away. It's like four year, you know, four to five years away, but the construction's underway. And everybody in co-op, everybody in Parkchester, people in Morris Park, all of a sudden they're connected to the whole region. They can go get jobs north in Westchester and Connecticut for the first time. They couldn't even get there before. So we're prioritizing those investments. The Second Avenue subway, that neighborhood, which is the most mass transit dependent neighborhood in the city in terms of car ownership and so on, uh, they th that you know they've been promised a subway since literally the 1940s when they started knocking mm. down the elevated trains. We're going to build the Second Avenue subway, and then finally, the governor has has made a priority of this new line that you know we've been thinking about for a while. But she grabbed it and made it a priority, which she calls the Interborough Express. It's taking an old freight line that runs from Brooklyn waterfront right through Brooklyn, including a lot of those low income neighborhoods we're talking about up to Jackson Heights and Queens, transit desert communities, connecting them to every rail system and all for the first time having a lot more Brooklyn, Queens uh, rail transportation. So you don't have to go to Manhattan to get out to Queens or vice versa. You know what I mean? So right. this is, you know, the, so the investments are trying to prioritize transit equity. And finally, Ebro, the, you know, something that I'm passionate about is there is a discount, you know, the, the cost of, uh, of mass transit uh, is, is an issue for some people, right? So we have a, a discount program in the city of New York for people who qualify as low income called Fair Fares. The city of New York runs it. And I have been advocating uh, along with the state for that to be expanded so more people get enrolled. There are a lot of people who qualify who don't even know about it, and they're eligible for half price Metro cards. So we want to get more people in that. And finally, we are actually making the new Omni system. If you've been riding recently, subways and buses, we have these Omni readers so you can tap and go like your credit card. And right. we're turning that into a way of getting people the best fare available so that you don't have to choose, do I lay out the 30 plus bucks at the beginning of the week to get a weekly? You could just tap your way to getting after 12 rides, the 13th and everything beyond it in a week is free. So... That is an equity play as well. And you know, we're, doing, we're doing some free, like super low price uh, travel inside the city on the commuter railroads. So if you're in Southeast Queens or Bayside or, you know, or part the Bronx, you can ride Metro North or Long Island Railroad around the city for just five bucks, which is almost half what it would be in, 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 in normal time. So, so we're doing a lot of stuff as comes back to your point, transit equity for low income communities. So with all of this, the investment in uh, new new uh, systems, all of it, can the money not fall on the riders? The can this not cause rates to go up, fares to go up? How do we keep fares from going up and still do all of the things you have planned? Uh, it's a good question, Ebro. We what, what what we were scheduled to have. You know, the MTA has been following a pattern which has been. I think reasonably successful of having very very small increases every couple of years, like four percent, right? Every two years, so like two percent a year. We said in the middle of COVID, it didn't make sense to even do that small increase. So last year in 2021, we we said no fair increase. This year in 2022, thanks to the gov the, the additional money that the governor uh, Governor Hochul has elected to give us through the budget. We've also been able to put off a fare increase. So we're putting off fare increases for two years. And on top of that, as I said, we're doing these fare promotions that actually reduce the cost for a lot of people. And we're trying to get more people into these half price Metro card programs we call fair fare. So, you know, we're definitely focused on keeping the price down. It only makes it makes sense. You're trying to get your riders back. Why would you raise the price? Just business logic. Well, not yeah, and not only just getting riders back because some people they don't have a choice. I think it's uh it's it's even deeper than that, which is you know uh keeping the city functioning. Yeah, making it so that people can actually you know live here and work here because so many people can't even afford to travel to work. Yeah, you no, know, let alone 
you know, let alone uh, try to, uh, you know, build up their family and, and, and try to have a great livelihood in general with the work that they're doing. Um, and I think that our elected officials using our taxpayer dollars, um, I think it behooves all of us to relieve some of that stress on the most vulnerable because it just creates a better atmosphere all the way around. And and how much is this Build Back Better uh, bill from Biden helping with the money in our state and specifically with the MTA? Well, let me just come back to your, your, your first point, which I think, you know, I got to say amen to all that. You know, my argument has been to the elected officials, look, COVID just showed us again and again that this is the, you know, this is the thing that makes it possible for people of moderate and low income to live in New York, right? They, they need the mass transit system. So there's, it showed us that it is an essential service like fire or police or sanitation. That's right. And the government ought to invest more in it rather than putting it entirely on the rider's back. So we are making that, uh, that, that point to the, our, our friends, and, and they are friends. Governor Huckle has been great in support of mass transit, but to our, our friends in elected office, uh, and, and we're counting on them to help us uh, balance the budget, which, you know, after the federal aid from, that came during COVID runs out, we're going to have a budget deficit. So we're, we're, we're counting on uh, the folks in Albany to, uh, to help out with that. As, you're, as far as the Build Back Better, the Biden infrastructure bill, look, you know, we have a, a $50 billion five-year capital program. Um, we have been investing hugely in trying to grow and modernize and fix up the mass transit system, buses, subways, and Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Um, but extra money from Washington is a good thing. So when the Biden infrastructure bill happened, uh, they projected that there would be $10 billion more for, uh, for New York out of that. But, you know, a lot of that is money that's going to come over time. You have to compete and got go it. get. You, you got to pitch for the money and have exactly. some representative go knock on doors and ring bells and, and put in invoices just, and all this other nonsense. Yeah, I mean, it's going to come in over time. So there isn't some magic bullet coming. The main thing is we've got this substantial capital program. As I said to you before, it includes these major transit equity investments as well as you know, state of good repair to maintain the system. We're investing in elevators for ADA access. We, we're got getting these new plot projects that are going to serve the right, you know, the communities we need to serve better. Um, just general buses, as I told you, we're going to keep doing that with the money from Washington, as well as uh, taking advantage of some of the new programs that Washington's offering. And, 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 and can we get a promise from you? So, so since it was like 2% every year increase, which was yeah. normal, and now you suspended it for two years. So that's 4% in increases that is not going to be on the books. You're not going to come back in two years and hit us with a 5 or 6% increase, are you? You're going to stick to the 2%. Listen, you know what? You asked me that like I'm in control, <laughs> in control of that. The answer is, uh, you know, you can talk to me. But in the end of the day, we're going to have to work that out with Albany because it, right. the, the, the subsidies that make it possible for us to keep the fare you know, 275 and to give out these new promotions that make it even cheaper um, really depend on how much money we get from Albany. Governor Hochul took the first step by putting in her bill, her, her budget this year, another $300 million. So we didn't have to have a fare increase this year. That's where we are. Well, it sounds like she wants the permanent job too. So she's doing all the right things. So we appreciate that down here, right? Because normally it feels like New York City and the state of New York is not on the same page when it comes to the subway. It's definitely a different era, and the governor and the mayor, the new mayor, uh, seem to be much more in tandem, and uh, the MTA is definitely benefiting. There it is. So back for the audience, back real quick before we uh, let Jano go, uh, one, I want to thank you again for coming on the program. Two, I want to let the audience know about my marketing idea with you and the rats, <laughs> um, which is we get Jano shirtless like Rambo because Jano sounds like Rambo, and then we put him with a flamethrower in the subway system, <laughs> and he's just basically beheading rat and getting rid of the rat infestation. It's like a, it's like a movie, but it's a commercial for the MTA, and it it makes everybody feel like yes, get rid of the rats. Hey, no, listen, yes or no? I'll, I'll do it if it if it brings the right amount of money to keep the fare down, it brings <laughs> the money from Albany. I'm all over it. <laughs> there you go. 
Hey, man, thank you so much for your time today, man. Great to be with you guys. Thanks again. And we'll, we'll catch up soon, man. We'll be reaching out if we hear any news or anything that needs to be talked about. Thank you for your time. Always happy to do it. Take care.